For our final story, I'm once again having my head examined. This time in the lab of Helen Neville at the University of Oregon, Eugene. You know, I think after the show, a lot of people will be wearing these. <laughs> <clears throat> We've had many requests for extra hats after our subjects see how fetching they are. Yes, a lot of people want to wear them out in the street. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> my, my cute little suspenders. <laughs> we don't want it to slip now. Well, we afraid my helmet will like whip off if I turn my head too fast. When we turn the propeller on. Yeah. We want to make sure you don't go anywhere. I'm going to ask you some dignified questions while I'm here. <laughs> That now a special gel is added to each of the 32 electrodes in the hat. Seven. Okay. Yep. The gel helps make electrical contact between the electrodes in my head. So too high. That's great. It has to be firmly worked into place to be effective. Yes, well, I think you drove the gel right into my scalp. <laughs> well, so you're making direct contact with there. the neurons there. I think you'll get a very good reading. Now let's go to the right hemisphere, T6. 62.9. I guess it's time to jam another Q-tip in my brain. That was the warm-up. But for the actual experiment, I'm going to have to plug in, get comfortable, and relax. You want to hold this? No, it's not. We're going to check first that we have good contact from all the electrodes and that we can see good, clean signal out of your head. And then we'll begin with the experiment. OK. OK. I'll just relax. When they're listening in on brain waves, neuroscientists like Helen have to get their subjects to reduce their muscle activity to a minimum so the faint signals from the brain can come through. OK, Alan, this looks really good. Keeping your eyes nice and still, your muscles are really relaxed. Keep that up. Helen studies where in the brain we process language. My task is simply to follow each sentence and register whether or not it makes sense. That one seems OK. Here's the next. Sue shared her candy with her best boat. Well, that's nonsense. But actually, the task itself isn't important. That's just to hold my attention. In fact, the system is continuously checking every electrode to look for tiny changes that might coincide with each new word flashing up. Averaged over hundreds of subjects, these signals show where in the brain different words are processed. The result is fascinating. Vocabulary words like light, daytime, candy, boat are processed in different places in both left and right hemispheres. But grammar words, her, with, the, in, are concentrated in parts of the left hemisphere. So for language, different parts of the brain have different jobs. That's true at least for adults. The question Helen Neville asked was, is the same true for children? Hi, Daddy. 14-month-old Dossie is at the stage of life when we rapidly acquire language. That's so pretty. <laughs> to find out what's going on in her brain, she needs to put on that charming hat with the electrodes, this time in a fetching shade of green. Oh, what a big bird. Dossie, however, has other ideas. I can't say I blame her. Well, how about the blue one? Oh, you see? It's pretty. Or well, maybe the yellow will do the trick. Oh, OK. Yes, oh, she's, she's taking it off Ernie. Ernie. She's <laughs> Liberate Ernie from me. Fortunately, Davy, her brother, couldn't see what all the fuss was about. With stuffed animals to hold his attention, he settled down to listen to a series of words while the system measured his brain's response. Bottle, carbon, cat, diaper. The result, once again averaged over many subjects, looks completely different from the adult pattern. Very young children process language all over the brain. But then pretty soon, by about age four or five, the typical adult specialized areas are emerging. This kind of result has important implications for education in general. Are there things we should be doing sooner when we educate children? We don't know when the critical time windows are. When learning math, learning music, learning science, different kinds of learning would be optimized. But I don't have any doubt that there are such critical windows 
of opportunity. We just need to do the research to determine when they are. What we do know is that from the point of view of language learning, early is better. For people who learn more than one language, the early locking in of the brain's language areas makes a big difference. Arthur Go, for example, speaks fluent Chinese and English. Where were you born? Um, Singapore. Singapore. How old were you when you started learning English? About three or four. So in school? Uh -huh, in school. So while English is Arthur's second language, he learned it when he was still young. When he's tested, his brain's response to English is indistinguishable from that of a native English speaker, with the same specialized areas for grammar and vocabulary. Where were you born? I was born in Yat Yat, Vietnam. Yat Yat? English is also Nick Hong's second language, but he didn't start learning it until age 10. And when responding to English, his brain looks different. There's no single grammar area. Nick ran up against a limit that confronts all late learners of languages. In my case, I, I started studying French in my teens. I got really serious about it in my late teens, and, and, and I, I, I thought I could speak pretty well. What, 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 were the, what were the things limiting me? The sound of the language and the grammar of the language are the parts of the language that suffer most from delayed learning of a language. Mm. So you probably speak with an accent in French. People will probably tell you that. And your grammar probably isn't perfect. On the other hand, you probably have a huge vocabulary. Nobody who learns a language after childhood can expect to speak it perfectly. Old King Cole was a merry old soul. And a merry old soul was he. So don't blame the speakers. For grammar and pronunciation, at least, you can't teach an old brain new tricks. He called for his pipe and he called for his pole. And he called for his fiddler's three. Every fiddler, he had a fine fiddle. And a very fine fiddle had he. Twee, twiddly dee, twiddly dee, when the fiddlers. But well, there's none so rare as can compare. With King Cole and his fiddler's three. If I didn't have words, I probably... Back in the lab, I met another of Helen Neville's test subjects, Dean Gable. When did you learn to sign? I learned when I was four years old. How, what brought that about? How did you learn to sign? When my parents found out that I was deaf, they found out that when I was two, and they decided to send me to the deaf school when I was four years old. And there is where I learned to sign. When Dean's response is tested in the same way as for a spoken language, the result looks like that of any other first language, with typical grammar and vocabulary areas. That makes sense because he learned sign language while still young. But take a look at this. It's a peripheral vision test in which Dean has to detect the flashing squares on the edges of the screen while concentrating on the one in the center. When his brain response is mapped, it shows he's using both the normal vision processing area and large sections usually devoted to sound. Of course, vision takes on critical importance when you're deaf. When I took the same test, my peripheral vision wasn't as good as Dean's, and I didn't use that extra processing area in the brain. This is the flip side of development in the young brain. Not only is it locking in particular parts for specific functions, but it can also invent new uses for sections if necessary. That's just amazing that you've got this uh, kind of, uh, the, the brain is kind of malleable like a piece of clay in a way. It's not so hard and fast as, as, uh, as at That's least right. I thought it was. That's right. There's no doubt about the fact that there are very strong biases or likelihoods according to which the brain will develop. That's why in 99.9% .9 of all the people, this is visual brain, this is auditory brain, this is the part that's important for touch, this is the part that's important for language. But these strong genetic biases can be changed, they can be modified within limits, within time limits. This is a sheep's brain. Our knowledge of what's going on inside all brains, of a cat, cats, sheep, or peoples, is still limited. It's a human brain, and we've cut it so you can see what It's easier to explain the processes taking place in the distant stars 
and in our own heads. Right above the ears is important for hearing. These lobes right here are important for making memories. The very top part is important in controlling movement. See That's how? one reason Helen likes to talk to school kids about what we do know. Oh. <laughs> Great challenges exist in neuroscience. We don't yet understand how three pounds of tissue produce consciousness, how our brains turn into our minds and into ourselves. Okay, you can eat that part. The brain may be the final frontier of science, waiting to be crossed by tomorrow's scientists. Like making decisions. The left side is for controlling your right side. There's a lot more of the brain that we didn't talk about. That's because scientists certainly don't by any means know what all the different parts of the brain do. That's why maybe some of you guys will grow up to be brain scientists. Because there's the most complicated structure in the universe that's going to take a lot of people to figure out how it works.